Hey everyone, this lesson is on the infectious disease known as brucellosis. So we're going to talk about what brucellosis is. We're also going to talk about some of the risk factors for getting it. We're also going to talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So brucellosis is a zoonotic infection caused by bacteria of the genus brucella. So if we break this actually down, zoonotic infection means it comes from animals. So we can think of zoo. And it's bacteria of the genus brucella, which is where the word brucellosis comes from. So brucellosis, an abnormal condition of infection by bacteria of the genus brucella. There are actually four species known to infect humans. And this condition is also known as Malta fever and Mediterranean fever. So what is the epidemiology of brucellosis? Where do we actually see this infection occurring? So this is actually a worldwide infection. It has a worldwide distribution. We can see it being endemic, which means that it is just there, present, in the Mediterranean, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, Central Asia, South Asia, China, Central, and South America. So it's in a wide variety of areas. And it's actually the most common zoonotic disease in the world. So again, zoonotic disease, a disease that comes from an animal source. And with regards to brucellosis, all age groups and genders are affected equally. So again, it is a zoonotic infection caused by a bacteria of the genus brucella, and it is worldwide. It's actually the most common zoonotic disease in the world, and all age groups and genders are affected. So how is this transmitted? We talked about it being a zoonotic infection, so it comes from animals, but what types of animals? So one of the risk factors or ways that this is transmitted, this bacteria, is by contact with cattle. So we can think of cows, goats, sheep, pigs, camels, and even dogs as well. But we can also get brucellosis or infection by brucella bacteria through ingestion of unpasteurized dairy milk. So it can come from cattle, and if the milk has not been pasteurized properly, so it's not heated to essentially kill the bacteria, you can get brucella infections that way as well. And then exposure to contaminated bodily fluids is another way too. So if there's some bodily fluids from animals or from other individuals who are already exposed or have been infected, this is another way that this can be transmitted. So those are the ways that the brucella bacteria can be transmitted. So either via contact with cattle, goats, sheep, pigs, camels, and dogs, ingestion of unpasteurized dairy products, or by exposure to contaminated body fluids. So we're now going to talk a bit more about the transmission and get into the pathogenesis of this infection. So consumption of unpasteurized beverages and foods, so drinking unpasteurized milk, for instance, is actually the most common risk factor for acquiring brucellosis. And infection from animals more often occurs when exposed to animal tissues and fluids. So if a farmer is exposed to a, an animal that's giving birth, that may be an example of actually being exposed to brucella bacteria causing brucellosis. So when an individual is exposed to brucella bacteria, the bacteria is phagocytized by immune cells and usually by macrophages. And this occurs usually in the gastrointestinal tract or the gastrointestinal mucosa. And then these macrophages can carry the brucella bacteria to the lymphoid tissue. So you can think of it entering into lymphatics and lymph nodes, and that is where it resides. And it actually has a relatively slow incubation period. So when an individual is exposed, it takes usually two to four weeks before an individual starts to have symptoms. But in some cases, this can take months. So the incubation period can take a long time. And in other cases, it can be very short. So it's a variable incubation period, but generally speaking, it's two to four weeks. So once the bacteria has been taken up by an immune cell and that immune cell brings it to the lymphatic system, it can reside within the lymphatic system for a while. So it can reside there for usually two to four weeks, but in some cases, a lot longer, for months. So what is the clinical presentation of brucellosis? So when an individual has been infected and after the incubation period, what are the clinical findings or what are some of the signs and symptoms? So the symptoms are often constitutional symptoms. So constitutional symptoms are often more nonspecific. We can see things like a fever. And a lot of times, brucellosis can be an important cause of fever of unknown origin. We can see night sweats. And what's interesting about 
these night sweats is that when they have night sweats, they have a moldy odor. So it kind of smells like mold. So very interesting. And they can also have malaise and they can also have weight loss. So these are the constitutional symptoms we see with brucellosis. We can see constitutional symptoms like fever, night sweats, malaise, weight loss, and other types of infections and in types of cancers as well. But in brucellosis, we see fever, night sweats that have a typical moldy odor, so very important to remember, malaise and weight loss. Other symptoms of brucellosis include some other nonspecific symptoms, including headache, joint aches and pains, abdominal pain, dyspepsia, so indigestion, cough, and depression. And there are a couple of important physical signs as well that we'll mention here. Hepatosplenomegaly, so hepato meaning liver, spleno meaning spleen, and megaly meaning enlarged. So we can see an enlarged liver and spleen. And a lot of times this may be due to infiltration of the lymphatic, so infiltration of the spleen. So this can lead to issues with hepatosplenomegaly. And then we can also see lymphadenopathy. So lymphadenopathy is where there's enlarged tender lymph nodes. So these are some of the other symptoms and some of the physical signs of brucellosis. So again, symptoms are oftentimes nonspecific, headache, joint aches and pains, abdominal pain, indigestion, cough and depression. And some of the physical signs include hepatosplenomegaly, so an enlarged liver and an enlarged spleen, and lymphadenopathy, so enlarged tender lymph nodes. So how do clinicians diagnose and treat brucellosis? So culturing of brucella bacteria is one way to diagnose. Serology is another way, so antibody titers against brucella, and there are certain increases that occur in certain time periods. So the antibody titer can increase by fourfold between an acute and convalescent phase. So that means that during the acute phase, they have symptoms. During the convalescent phase, they're getting better. Their symptoms are improving. So if we see an increase by fourfold between this, this is a clinical indicator for brucellosis diagnosis. Usually two samples are taken greater than two weeks apart. So once brucellosis has been diagnosed, how do clinicians treat it? So it depends on the patient populations. So with regards to non-pregnant patients, doxycycline is used, and it's used often in combination with gentamicin and septra. But in pregnant patients and in children, doxycycline is not used. And clinicians will use rifampin, with or without septra as well. So again, diagnosis oftentimes by culture, but serology of antibody titers against brucella is a way to diagnose. And then treatment depends on if a patient is non-pregnant or pregnant. So in non-pregnant patients, doxycycline, which can be in combination with gentamicin or septra, and with pregnant patients, rifampin with or without septra as well. So I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel if you want more information on other infectious diseases, please check out my infectious disease playlist. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.